Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of An Irish Knitting Podcast. I am Sam, I'm an artist and illustrator coming to you from a very gloomy and rainy Dublin in Ireland. You can find me all around the internet looking for Irish farm art, on my website irishfarmart.com, on Ravelry, Etsy, in which I try uh, to sell a few of my original artworks and as well on my dedicated Instagram account uh, in Irish Knitting Podcast. If you're new to my channel, you're so very welcome. There's been quite a few new people lately on this channel and that makes me extraordinarily happy and full of joy. And I started this channel to grow this knitting community around me as I don't really have a physical knitting community or a knitting group. So thank you so much for coming by. This is my attempt of a knitting podcast or like other YouTubers say, it's my little corner of the internet in which I try to share finished works, works in progresses, acquisitions, and uh, literally anything that is driving my artistic and crafty life uh, journey. Um, I really hope you enjoy what I'm showing you and uh, please consider to subscribe to this channel. We are so very close to the 5,000 subscriber mark and uh, I can't really believe it. If I think about putting together 5,000 people and speaking to them, well, this wouldn't happen, believe me. So you're very, very welcome. Today on the show, we have plenty of knitting. We have a couple of uh, finish and half finish works, uh, a few works in progresses, and if the postman comes in time, we will have some acquisitions. I'm just waiting and listening if the bell uh, is going to ring at any time. So let's hope so. We have as well the launch of a knit along. Yes, it's that time of the year. And at the end of this video, but I'm not going to spoil the surprise, you're probably in for a little treat. I have a little surprise for you. There are spoilers around the room. I don't know if your eye is um, sharp enough to catch them. If you do, put a comment below in the description. But once again, you're in for a treat if you endure to the end of this podcast. So without any further ado, grab your cup of tea, coffee. I just need a little coffee and let's get started. It's now after seven in the morning. If I am good enough in this business of filming, this will be done before the work day starts. So let's get to it. The first thing that we need to address is the big elephant in the room here, which is not me, although uh, size-wise I might be considered some sort of elephant, but anyway, yeah, <laughs> the jumper that I'm wearing. You have seen this in my uh, last podcast as a Finnish work. This is the Islander sweater by Sannes Garn. It comes from uh, the pattern comes from this book here, um, which is actually the sweater that this guy is wearing on the cover of the book. This is the Tema 72 uh, booklet, book of patterns. Uh, it's uh, called Norwegian Icons in the English translation. I can't really say that in Norwegian, uh, unfortunately I don't speak the language. If you manage to get this book, and I will put down here some resources to find a sunless pattern if you are not in Norway, this is a brilliant book. It's full of amazing patterns. Uh, let me show you. I don't know if you ever uh, can see this, but it's full of amazing jumpers and uh, the pictures as well are just gorgeous. I made quite a few of uh, these designs in my time and every single of this pattern turns out amazing. So let's get into this sweater here. First of all the yarn. Um, the pattern calls for a 
decay sport weight yarn the gauge is quite interesting so I decided to avoid completely the gauge uh, and knit using a four ply a fingering weight yarn this is uh, Sun Satin Pierre Gint which is 100% wool yarn from Norway and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's gorgeous uh, if you know about Pierre Gint which is their Sunless Garn DK yarn it's a gorgeous lofty wooly wool without being super itchy I as many of us have terrible problem with itchiness especially around my neck area and on the, the arms uh, but Pierre Gint consistently is great it's not itchy at all it's uh, nice and lofty and warm uh, a few years ago uh, they came up with the thinner version of Pierre Gint so same composition in terms of wool and origin of the wool which is actually very important for myself but for Sunness as a company as well and uh, the yarn is just great. It's like knitting with a sock yarn but without having the nylon uh, content in it. It's just a super lofty, super thin and uh, slide through your needles very well. And the fabric that it creates is just great. Now, uh, being this pattern um, designed for a heavier way of yarn I had to do uh, some modifications some that I do all the time which makes the garment fit me a little better and some other that I never made before that I think resolve some of the issue that I had with um, of course not respecting gauge so first of all it's a bottom-up sweater so you start from the waist you knit up you divide uh, for the sleeves um, you put your body aside you knit the two sleeves joining together and start the um, raglan decreases uh, and then you knit up for the color of course so there came the first modification that I made um, I choose as size the second last one which uh, if you know my business here is the size that is closer to my 240 stitches I take 240 stitches if I'm uh, knitting in fingering way yarn at my waist and I know more or less that that works as a size for me now the thing that I modify there uh, is the length of the bust of course considering that uh, you're working with a finger away yarn your own age is not matched so I had to do some sort of modification in order to get my length right and respecting the super simple color work if I haven't mentioned this, this is a full-on color work. So every fourth row, you have two rows of uh, color work in the Islander situation. Uh, and it turned out just amazing. What else? Um, row gauge came to be very, very important when it came to Raglan decreases. Joining uh, the sleeves and knitting up you have a massive almost 400 stitches of um, circumference here at the top of your bust and uh, the pattern says to decrease at a certain uh, rate for the raglan and I did follow that without even thinking originally and I came to have a massive, massive raglan decrease that was like a big giant funnel and that didn't really work and I realized that I wasn't following row gauge correctly because of course you have more stitches and uh, the creases are designed for that amount of stitches which go up and close down to the neck and uh, decreasing that much with that speed of rate um, didn't really work so I went down to the drawing table and I realized that I needed a different speed of decreasing for the raglan 
so I did that and it turned out to be quite nice. Still, it's a bit long in the decrease. If you see my underarm here, it's a bit further than I would have expected or that I would have liked, which is all right. I kind of um, didn't like it when I was blocking it. I was like, okay, I need to redo the decrease again, changing again the rate of decreasing. Part of me didn't want to do that. I needed the color already. I banded off and uh, um, sewn in all the edges. So if this didn't work, it would have been a massive, massive job. But this morning I just put it on after blocking over the weekend and it just turned out to be quite nice. Do I mind the underarm situation? Probably not. Now that I'm seeing myself on the viewfinder of the camera, I think it turned out all right overall. Um, something that I modify apart from uh, that uh, little raw gauge issue is the cuffs, the color rate of uh, change of color. If you see, the pattern is similar but is not the same. Just because using this fingering way yarn, it didn't really turn out nice. It was a big block of black color uh, which I didn't like so it's just preference but it's just nothing uh, really concerning the design of the sweater it's just a personal preference and if I find it yeah I put in a row of red yarn just to make it a little bit more personal you barely can see it but I do I do like this little touch makes it feel a little bit more personal what else then? Uh, yeah, nothing else, to be honest. Sadness patterns are always good. They always fit very well, especially on a male body. I haven't needed anything uh, for a female designed body, uh, but um, uh, I adapted uh, quite often patterns that are written for female um, shapes to my own shape. I just need for myself. I never have needed a sweater jumper for someone else, so I can't really speak for other body type, but they work very well for my body type. The color combination. We have a black and uh, a very, very light gray. Simple. Um, the colors, I unfortunately don't have any balls here. But the colors are um, just amazing. Huge amount of variety of color in a thin peer gimped. By the way, not sponsored. So you're asking me why do I need another um, Islander sweater? Well, um, I have knitted this pattern and other um, type of Islander. Islander is or Icelander. It's a very uh, famous um, Nordic pattern. I don't think it comes from Iceland, but the style is that one of a old sweaters uh, from uh, the fishermen's uh, from the north of Norway and uh, Iceland, uh, Scandinavia generally. And um, I was watching um, Kia's board podcast and Kia she uh, is making an Icelander, Islander sweater for her husband and she was showing other project that she made before in the years and I was super fascinated and uh, I really wanted another one. In the past I made one using Rauma Finul uh, which is a sport weight yarn and that turned out to be massive just because me not being a swatcher i took my 240 rule of stitches as we just said and i applied it to uh, rauma yarn without thinking and i was in a lovely dark rich brown and um, like a mustardy color 
I had to give it to my dad because it turned out massive and didn't suit me. But I really wanted to get um, an Islander that suit me well. I know, it's just a nice little cozy pattern and uh, yeah, I thanks to Kia's board podcast I made this one and thank you Kia for as well mentioning me sometimes in your podcast uh, that really means a lot she is a brilliant brilliant uh, um, podcaster from Sweden I think she is so yeah I hope she is getting ready for the Eurovision <laughs> so I'll come in there very very soon in a few weeks so very happy with this jumper I can try to give you a little view if I manage not to destroy the camera as you see fits very well I can't really say much on uh, that sunless patterns are usually great I'm not sponsored I just said that I'm not sponsored by sadness I wish I was let's go on with the Finnish works of way works <laughs> This is as well inspired by another podcaster. I basically spend my evenings knitting and watching other podcasters because apparently I don't have a life anymore. <laughs> Who guess what this is? This is a teeny tiny jumper for a teddy bear. And especially this is a color work tiny tiny raglan jumper for a teddy bear and uh, the inspiration for this came from uh, It's a Sarah podcast and Sarah was making a blue rabbit for her knees and I found that so very inspiring. She made this lovely little um, teddy bear rabbit thing, stuffed toy and uh, she made uh, a little jumper, a little cardigan, and uh, what else? Uh, trousers, shoes, all a wardrobe. And I was like, I do need one of those in my life, just to sit on the couch, have a lovely cozy jumper, and uh, look nice and sassy there. So I was browsing my patterns, and I came up to this pattern here. This is the Boy Teddy Bear by Julie Williams from The Little Cotton Rabbits. And you can find this pattern on the Ravelry. Uh, I put all the links below. It's basically a tiny little teddy bear with a gorgeous uh, wardrobe and you can buy additional wardrobe patterns and so on and so forth. I did actually have this pattern in my library. I made one before that was given away as a present, if I remember well, or I can't find it anywhere in the house. So last weekend, after watching um, Sarah from the It's a Sarah podcast, I fell in love with that. I had to make one. But I didn't have any yarn suitable for this pattern in my stash. For the bear, uh, they call for an iron weight yarn. And I just bought it last uh, Friday or Saturday and I'm expecting it any time in the post here. So waiting for that, I was like, oh, I definitely need some hard jumping thing, as um, Sarah would say. So I started by making um, the first few garments of the teddy bear. We have this one, which is the feral jumper, and uh, I have started with just a few rows uh, for a little tiny cardigan to go on the top of a jumper. I know this is probably super silly, a 30-something years old man that needs a teddy bear jumper, but like, look at this. Everybody needs one of these in their house, just sitting on the couch, uh, looking super mega happy and sassy. It just brings you a little bit of joy every day, I think. And uh, yeah, I can't wait to get my teddy bear done and, um, and yeah, make lovely little jumpers for him and trousers and all of that. Now, this jumper is knitted up using 
Fable from Drops. Fable is a sock yarn, it's kind of my to-go sock yarn that I kind of use all the time because it's just easily available in Ireland. Is it the best sock yarn? Probably not. It's quite sheer. You can see my finger showing through uh, the yarn here, considering that this is a white uh, yarn. So it's not really great for socks, but you know, it's a 25-75 combination of wool and um, acrylic and it works well if you are kind of experimenting with the design or something like that. The thing that made me choose the yarn is that, yeah, it's easily available in Ireland and I have quite a few of uh, different colors that I kept in my stash from a couple of years ago. I was making a collection of uh, new patterns, uh, sock patterns inspired by Venice and the Venetian architecture. And um, yeah, I kept all the colors there. That was the easiest way for me to experiment with color work without uh, really breaking my bank. So here we go. I don't know if I should consider this a finished work or a work in progress, but if the teddy bear uh, comes to the finish stage, probably this is gonna be a finished work because I will make so many. Of these little things. Let's go on with the uh, works in progress and um, something that I've done that I said that I was not going to do it's a sock. Now this is technically finished I just need to graft uh, the the toe here. This pattern is uh, the heel tab shorty socks by Larissa Gregory, Gregory, it's basically a shorty sock, which I should have put on a sock blocker if I was a good podcaster, but I'm not, which has a little tub at the back of your heel. Um, it's a free pattern and is actually extraordinarily well explained. The beauty of this pattern, which is what I wanted to try, is that is made using short rows everywhere, meaning the tab at the back, the heel and the toe. Everything is made with short rows. And the way that uh, the designer explains short rows is so effective that you barely can see any gaps. The way I have been knitting short rows, German short rows before, as always shows, showed some little gap here and there, which is fine when you block them or you sold in the end, so you can always catch the little gap. But in this case, it's actually gone completely, which is great. Now, this is my second attempt of this sock. Not because the pattern is difficult to read or badly explain, Absolutely not. The pattern is absolutely perfect. It's my gauge. It's it's unbelievable. Like, I can't get gauge. I don't know what's happening with me, if it's just that time of the year in which I can't get a gauge or what. But I'm using two millimeter needles and I am uh, using the Fable yarn here in a very light uh, gray as well. I started with knitting the second size, which is 64 stitches at the cuff, and that was massive. Then I ripped off, went down to the first size, which is 60 stitches per centimeter, per 10 centimeters, and this is still big. I don't know what's wrong with me. The gauge is 38 stitches by 48 rows, which is a teeny tiny gauge. And I can't get it. I absolutely can't get it. I don't have in my stash, in my supplies, any thinner needle than two millimeters. I don't even know if they do thinner needles now that I think of it. But yeah, any idea how I can solve this? This is still big. 
it's uh, still too slouchy from my liking. The foot goes through externally easily, so it's not a problem of uh, stretchiness or anything. I don't know what's going on, I don't know why, I can't get gauge. Should I tense my yarn more? Should I try a different type of knitting? I mean, this is what I wanted, I wanted shorty socks, I wanted to understand how to make short rolls so well, but I'm a bit upset with them being too slouchy, especially on this part here, on the cuff side. It's not really what I uh, was looking for. Any suggestion, any recommendation is more than welcome. Something that I've done as modification to avoid this horrible slouchiness of the sock is adding some ribbing at the middle of the foot and on the top right at the center this brings everything a little bit together in a nicer fashion but the problem with the calf still remains which makes me quite upset because i really want to make a pair of socks that i am using at the beginning i said that i wasn't going to do this i wasn't going to make any more socks i got from my grandmother a few christmases ago a giant bag literally one of those uh, black bean bags full of hand knitted socks that she did for myself <laughs> So she know that since I was a very young child, I do like to wear hand knitted socks. And she went into a spree of knitting socks and she made, I would say 50 pair of socks for me because she was like, oh, well, I don't know how long I'm gonna be around. My grandmother is quite young, so. Uh, and I, I want you to have a lot of socks. And she made this giant bag of socks. I think I share some pictures of those in my um, Instagram account somewhere. Uh, all the colors, just our own pattern. Um, if you follow this channel for a while, you know that we have a Venetian style socks. I don't know if it's Venetian or if it's my grandmother's uh, way of knitting uh, socks, but it's a nice uh, little particular pattern uh, and if you are interested in knowing a little more about that all my sock patterns on Ravelry have that specific Venetian heel so you can find it quite easily there so back to square one I have this bag of socks and I wear them quite often so all the socks that I made myself uh, haven't got the I don't know if uh, stretchiness or uh, haven't been used let's say at all so I gave to charity all my collection of uh, hand knitted socks and knitted by me the ones that my grandmother made I'm gonna keep them uh, for wearing and for you know a memory sake as well they are just too dear to uh, give to charity maybe in the future who knows Anyway, I gave away to them and I was like, I'm not going to make uh, any more socks. I don't use them. It's just going to be a waste of yarn and uh, just an exercise in knitting. And then I realized that I'm wearing all the time shorties, uh, going to the gym, walking around the house. I find Sorry, the camera just stopped for some reason. It was overheating. Uh, anyway, I was saying that I'm wearing all the time shorty socks. Uh, I find I'm just easier to wear uh, a preference who knows uh, and uh, so i was like i'm gonna try and knit some shorties and this pattern looks amazing it was free so i'm trying not to buy more patterns that i don't need and they turn out good it's just the slouchiness and the problem of gauge i don't know what it is so if you have any recommendation please send it over to me i am super eager to learn i think the camera stopped because i've been speaking for too long so let's go on with the next work in progress i'm ravaging my tote bag here for the next one so we have 
an issue. This is an issue. Here it is, probably without all the ends, but uh, first off, this is the men's cable pullover number seven by Novita. Now, if you don't know about Novita, Novita is a brand of yarn, if I'm correct, from Sweden. The website is literally full of amazing patterns. We have like this is uh, knitted in pieces. We we'll go to that in a second. We have jumpers knitted in the round, huge amount of um, garments for female uh, bodies, uh, a lot of garments for male bodies, and they are all written down amazingly and they are all free. I didn't know about that. I was looking for a fingering weight cable sweater um, for myself and I came across Novita patterns and uh, it was just boom, my mind exploded. They are amazing and beautiful. So jump now into onto the Novita website. I'm gonna put the link below. Uh, I'm sure you're gonna find patterns that you love. Once again, I think Kia's board, podcast, Kia mentioned this before. She needed a lot of Novita patterns as well. So that probably was something that came from her too. Anyway, uh, this uh, jumper, the uh, men's cable pullover number seven, it's knitted in pieces. It, you need the front, the back, the two sleeves and you sew them together. Now, I wasn't going to do that. You know me, I despise knitting cables and I despise knitting uh, in pieces. But now, I have tried that many, many time, times and I never succeeded to it. Probably because I was using a wrong type of yarn or the project didn't spark joy to me or whatever. So I decided I'm gonna use a yarn that I love and I'm using this yarn that was kindly gifted to me by Roots of the Roots Lo Loves to Knit podcast. I'm mentioning so many podcasts. This is Woolly Knit in the color Stormy Blue, if I'm right. And the root, uh, she was so massively kind to gift me a huge amount of this yarn. And uh, it's probably on the top of my most favorite yarns ever. So I was like, I'm gonna use this. I'm gonna make a cable jumper and I found a pattern from Novita and this is the result. Now, it's not an issue of knitting. As you can see, I went quite far on the body side. It's a lovely um, yarn, lovely speed and a beautiful pattern, extraordinarily easy to follow. The issue that I have is that the pattern, once again, is uh, written for a DK yarn. And I'm using a very thin fingery way yarn. So I thought I'm gonna follow the 240 rule, which is at the bottom you have 240 stitches. So if this is gonna be the front side, the front panel, I'm gonna half that. Now, Look at this. This is basically the width of a sleeve. I have no idea how I can fit into this. The question is now, am I gonna endure in this and make the front and the back sew them together and see if that works? Or am I gonna just frog this and start again with a different size? I have no idea. I try to stretch it a little bit, it kind of works, but at the same time, if I have issues with the width now, think about having to deal with uh, the, the creases, the, the shaping of the armhole and all of that. I don't know if I'm brave enough to endure in this. Also, if I frog this now, this is a full length of yarn so it won't to have any won't have any gaps in the yarn any breakage you know what i mean but at the same time it's a lot of work and um, i don't know i don't know i don't know 
I just want a nice fingery weight cable jumper and I can't find anything. So yeah, that's it. That was uh, basically it for my uh, finished works, work in progresses. We don't have any acquisitions because the postman hasn't come yet and I don't think it will come so early in the morning, to be honest. I was too hopeful, let's say. Uh, let's talk about um, the car, Nitalon. So, let me put on this before everything. As you can see, this is a rainbow pin and uh, as per the best tradition of an Irish knitting podcast, we uh, officially launched the Rainbow Cal 24. I repeat, I put on the screen, hashtag Rainbow Cal 24. Um, best tradition because last year I started the Rainbow Cal uh, 23 um, knit along to celebrate uh, Pride Month, which is coming in a couple of months, and to knit something colorful to show a little bit of support for the LGBTQA community. Now, you don't have to be an LGBTQA person, um, you just need to be an ally and uh, show some support for the LGBT co community. I decided to run this call again this year because it's uh, very important to support the community, to share a little bit of awareness and um, you know to make it normal. And I am weighing these words very, very heavily and precisely because talking about normal and normality is difficult, especially nowadays in which we everything seems to be normal in a society, but it's absolutely not in another society. Now, I come from Italy. Uh, I'm living in Ireland, as you well know. And in Italy, what is normal in Ireland may not be so normal. So, starting this call um, is a way for me to show some support to the LGBT community, but as well to talk about it, to make it uh, once again, normal, to take away the fear, the um, doubt, the scare of the LGBT community to normal people. Now, if I think about uh, talking about LGBT people or LGBT lives before when I was a kid, living and growing up in a very religious and a very conservative northern Italy, that was quite a taboo, it was quite something that you wouldn't really speak loud and openly about. And if people spoke about the LGBT community, that would have been uh, also with a angle of mockery, or something that was far away, uh, something that was dangerous and dark. You know what I mean? Nowadays, I see kids, especially here in Ireland, which is probably one of the most open countries in the world, it's super normal for kids to talk about the LGBT community. And so I would like to make this true all around the world and uh, especially all around the knitting community. Uh, we are a lot of people and I'm sure 99.9% .9 of us knitters are completely fine with any LGBT talks and we support actively the community and a lot of us are LGBT ourselves. 
So with this rainbow cal 24 I would like to start the discourse and start to talk about it. So apart from all the emotional fact of the situation and we'll go to talk about it going further in the month wrapping up to uh, June which is um, LGBT month how does this work well super easy as last year you just need to make something um, a hat a sweater an object um, a pair of gloves a pair of socks a scarf whatever you want knitting or crocheting or embroidery even if any of us can do embroidery i can't but using the rainbow colors or the colors of any of the LGBTQA plus flags. I am going to put some uh, resources down below so you can have a look at all the combination of colors and there are plenty. So knit something using the LGBT colors and uh, put it on Instagram or uh, Ravelry or if you don't have these resources, send me a message. Please share it to any Facebook groups that you want. Be uh, sure to tag me uh, on any of the social medias that I have a presence in. And uh, at the end of June, we'll uh, wrap it up, uh, draw some prizes and um, that's it. So um, now it's going to be running from today until the end of June. And uh, I only ask you to knit something using the LGBT colors that can be a finished work or a work in progress. I don't really mind. I know that three months, April, May, June, it's quite a short time to knit something in the LGBT colors and to knit something it's very short amount of time and we are wrapping up into uh, summer as well which is a lower time for knitting so just um, tag me um, share the love share this call uh, with your podcast if you have one with your knitting group the more we have the better it's not for me uh, to grow my platforms, but is for the actual meaning. I really want to start a conversation, share the discourse, make it normal, and uh, yeah, uh, show support for the LGBT community. Thank you, thank you so, so much about this. So, Rainbow Cal 24 is starting now. Price wise, um, I'm gonna think about it and talk about it in the next few episodes, but um, yeah, I think of some yarns, perhaps some hand-dyed yarns from here in Ireland and uh, if you have any suggestions for prices, let me know. I'm always open to talk about it. So, uh, the surprise that I was telling you, have you checked around the room what's the clue for the surprise? Well, let me get to it in a second. The clue was just here on the top of my mantelpiece there. And we're gonna talk about this guy here, Dante, Dante Alighieri. So this is not knitting related. So if you are um, not interested in uh, knowing who this guy is and why I'm talking about this, no worries. Thank you so much for uh, watching. Uh, this episode please remember to subscribe if we get to the 5k uh, anytime soon I will do a nice big giveaway as well so yeah thank you so so much for all of your support so let's start talking about Dante let me get comfortable here and why I am excited to talk about him who was him and why I'm talking about him so I'm talking about Dante because on the 25th of March, just past, uh, it was uh, all around the world celebrated Dante Day or Dante Di in Italian. And it was the day that marked the beginning of Dante's journey through 
the Inferno, uh, Purgatory and Paradise on his Divine Comedy, Divina Commedia. And it's uh, celebrated in Italy um, for the reasons that I'm going to tell you in a second. And it's celebrated all around the world as well, from all the Italian Institute of Cultures that are um, sparse around the world. Uh, I think it's important for me to talk about this as an Italian and Irish person, to spread a little bit the news about Dante and also because uh, I know that the vast majority of my audience here is not from Italy or Europe so you may have heard of Dante but you may not know who he was and why is so interesting and so important to kind of read about it and what a treat it will be if you get true reading about Dante. So, Dante Alighieri, this guy here, I am actually going to put a picture of Dante here, so at least we have the man. Big parenthesis, we don't know if this man looked like that, as we don't have any picture of any paintings of him at all. Can you hear this? They just decided to do some works, I'm so annoyed. Anyway, Dante, who was he? He was a man that was born in Florence in 1265. So, right before the beginning of the Renaissance era in Italy. He was born in Florence. He was uh, born from a quite rich family, wasn't noble at all, but uh, his uh, parents and his brothers used to deal with... Um, uh, with money lending, they had uh, a business in lending money, lending land and houses and all of that. Now, another little bracket. I am no expert in literature and what I'm telling you is all that I got from my own personal interest in Dante and from what we learn in school. It is important that you notice that if you are Italian, you don't need any of this because the culture of Dante is so instilled in your everyday life that everybody knows who Dante is and why it's important to read Dante and what they've done. Uh, so all of this is just part of my own personal culture growing up as an Italian person. As we said, he was born in Florence in um, uh, 1265. Uh, Florence back then was a republic, was governed by um, the people. Literally, every person that worked, that was employed, could uh, become governor of the city, could be part of the councils and so on and so forth. It's a very interesting form of government. Uh, the Florentine ones in that era. It was completely a man of the Middle Ages. It uh, was himself part of the government for a while and he got in very big troubles for being part of the government of the city and for being uh, part of a political uh, party that we're gonna mention in a second. As I said, his parents and his brothers uh, used to deal with money and they were wealthy enough to allow Dante not to work at all. Um, we don't have any news about him being employed or being um, dealing in uh, the business of his family. I think he just managed to sell some of his uh, inheritance and just leave uh, um, of his own art and uh, be employed in politics in the city. So it was a man that just grew uh, to build up his own culture and uh, do what he loved the most, which was writing. And for the first time, almost ever, someone like Dante decided to write this book in 
vulgar language, which is the grandfather, let's say, of modern Italian. And we as Italian people are so lucky that we can read this book and Dante writing in our own language, which is something that nobody else can do and understand it, which is absolutely great. If you think that this was written in the year 1200 and we can still read it, like, unbelievable, it's just mind-blowing. Anyway, we were saying that he wrote this in Italian and was one of the first people that decided to write uh, a book in Italian. I'm using the word Italian a little loosely, but this was kind of Florentine or vulgar language, which was, of course, the language of Florence, but it was understood and kind of spoken with a bit of a difference here and there all around Italy. Even in Venice, where I'm from, there was a proto-Venetian, an old Venetian language, which is similar in aspects to uh, the Florentine language that Dante used. So, in that time, nobody wrote in uh, Italian. They wrote in Latin. Latin was the language of culture, was the language of poetry. And in that specific time, there was kind of a renaissance of Latin language as well. They started uh, Cicero, they started uh, Caesar, uh, Cato, and all those um, Latin poets. And they wanted to get back into the classic Latin, the proper Latin, not the Latin that the church spoke or the regular people wrote in or spoke in. And so it was very difficult for uh, them, or very unusual, let's say, for them to write in uh, Italian. And so that's why first Dante is important to us, because it's the first big uh, piece of writing that we have in our own language. And is considered nowadays as the father, or one of the fathers of a modern Italian language, as, as well, modern Italian culture. So he grew up in Florence, and he was part of um, a political party which was called the Guelfi. And uh, Guelfi, I have no idea what's the translation in English, is basically the political party that saw the Pope of Rome as the figure that would uh, kind of help Italy to bring back the former glories. On the other side, the other political party were the Ghibellini. Ghibellines? no idea, which were the people that saw on the emperor of Germany uh, as the figure that would uh, help Italy get back to its former glories. Anyway, it was part of a part, a subdivision of the Guelphi um, party. And after some troubles in Florence, which I'm not going to get into it, although it's really, really interesting, interested uh, went into some troubles that particular part of the Guelphi uh, party and he was exiliated outside Florence. Now, when he was exiliated, Dante was in Rome uh, as an ambassador to the Pope for the city of Florence. He came back and he found that uh, the other side of the Guelphi party was in power and they exiliated uh, himself and other people that were um, part of the wrong side of the political party. So he found himself walking around uh, uh, Italy and being hosted by uh, some Italian families uh, all around the country. Now, you have to think about Italy as a very different country back then. It was divided in about 20 different uh, um, cities, states, um, little kingdoms, um, um, little self-ruling states and everyone was uh, almost always uh, fighting with the neighbors and it was a very very different country but um, the common thread was uh, the culture every single one of these states 
found themselves within the Italian culture or the former uh, Roman Empire culture. And so Dante started to write the Divine Comedy. The Divine Comedy is a massive, massive poem. Now, I don't remember how many verses it has, but I can find out in a second, just looking at it. So, you know, I can't find out, but it's uh, three um, big books, um, Inferno, Purgatory and Paradise, and it's all a poem. You can see I'm opening a random a page. This is the text. And these are the notes, these are written by someone else's, but the text of Dante is there. And it's all written in vulgar language or uh, old Florentine, old Italian. He starts his journey on the 25th of uh, March. And we know that because he tells us that. And he starts his journey um, being lost in a dark wood. Um, being lost there was kind of the allegory of his life being um, exiliated abroad, not being able to go back. And he started on a self-reflection. Why is he finding himself into that dark forest, a dark wood? And what's going on? So, he meets his guide, which is Virgilio, which is a, a Roman poet that did a similar trip as Dante down to hell, purgatory and paradise, or what they had back in the Roman time. So starts his journey, goes down into hell. Uh, in every single chapter of this uh, opera, this book, this poem, he finds people that everybody knew, famous people like popes, kings, um, noblemen, poets, his own ancestors, friends of his, people that were well known back when Dante was writing this. So that's why as well this is such an important book to us because we get to know about the real people that were living there. And with an extraordinary amount of wit, he put these people in hell rather than purgatory, rather than paradise. Uh, every single one for a specific reason. One of the parts that I prefer of uh, Inferno, of hell, is when he speaks about uh, Paolo and uh, Francesca. Paolo and Francesca were uh, two lovers that um, really loved each other very much and he described them as um, being embraced in hell and sputtered around this massive room in Inferno, hugging each other and being so much in love with each other and reading uh, a book together. And it's just such a beautiful piece of poetry that I really would recommend you to read about it. Uh, anyway, uh, it goes through hell, uh, to purgatory, uh, into paradise, and then he comes out from paradise and we have the end of this uh, Divine Comedy. The Divine Comedy was extraordinarily uh, popular when it was written again Dante. I don't know if wealth, but for sure his name was very, very famous all around uh, Europe as well when he was writing this. America wasn't discovered yet, so <laughs> we don't know if uh, uh, it could ever be popular there as well. But it was written, was copied uh, all around Europe and uh, the commentary of the Divine Comedy, the commentary is this little world that we have down here which is basically necessary to understand what Dante is talking about in his poem is being uh, written and done for by a lot of uh, um, studios or by a lot of um, 
very famous, very important researchers and people. His own uh, sons wrote one of the first commentary to the Divine Comedy. So we celebrate Dante D or Dante Day on the 25th of March. I wanted really to record something about that specifically to celebrate Dante, but um, Easter was about, I was at home, it was impossible. Anyway, I really hope you enjoy this little parenthesis on Dante. There's so many words that I want to say about him and why it's so important for us and for the modern um, culture that I, yeah, I would like to talk about this a lot more. But I think a little nugget here I gave you. A couple of books that I would recommend, of course, if you can get a hold on the Divine Comedy in any of your translations, I really would recommend you to get one that has an Italian front text. So Italian English, for example. So at least you can see the words in Italian language and understand the sound of it. Because every single verse is written using specific rhymes, so it sounds different. I don't know if that makes any sense to you. But it's just very beautiful. And it's a book that you will have in your library. It's been there for centuries and it's nice if we have a copy of this, I think, in the library. The other thing that I would like to recommend to you is this book from Alessandro Barbero, which is a modern um, historical um, professor of... Um, I don't remember which uh, university in Italy, but it's a really good book. And it's a story of uh, Dante as a human being and as a poet as well. It's a really, really easy to read. It's like... Uh, a novel basically but it gives you all you want to understand about this very important figure for the Italian culture and for generally the European culture uh, is translated in uh, almost every languages so you can find this somewhere I'm gonna try and put the English translation and the Italian one down below in the description as well uh, as a link to some marketplaces. Anyway, I really hope you enjoyed this little bracket and you enjoyed the podcast generally. It's probably gone on for two hours. I need to start working now. And uh, remember, a Rainbow Cal 24 as well. Uh, I'll see you very, very soon. Bye-bye.